Hello, everyone. I am Samuel Tessier, the head of organizational outreach at KSUIF, Kent State's independent film group. And this is our cinematic strategy series. Today, we will be going over uh, film, uh, live television, filmmaking, and any questions you want, guys want to ask live, send them in the comments. But today we have Zach Borenstein. He's been around the block for his young career so far, doing a bunch of live TV, uh, uh, short films, anything. He's very diverse. So we're going to bring him on. Here he is. Hello, Zach. Hey, How hey. I'm good. I was digging that waiting room music. It was very, uh, had, to, had like a uh, fun little piano. Oh, thank you. It. We try to do our full high class production here in my bedroom in Pittsburgh. So there's a lot of work that goes into this. Yeah. And, you are know, you guys in, are you guys in, in school right now? I, yeah, I, we're in school right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm in the midst of a short film production that's filming next week for a project. So Congratulations. That's that. exciting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, but not about me today, Zach. I have a few really short questions just to kick it off. What's the last film you've seen, Zach? That I've seen. Oh, I just saw Nomad Land, which is Nomad incredible. Land. It's so I mean I, I just love it. Just those kind of like, it's like in that genre of movie, like the Florida project where it almost feels like a documentary just cause it's like so muted and subtle and like not a ton happens. So it, you know, maybe you, it's like, it, you have to like really pay attention to it, but it's great. Like character study. And it's a, it's a good one. Francis McDormand's amazing. Yeah. I've been on clubhouse a lot lately and there's some filmmakers on there and, one guy who directed uh, American, oh shoot, American X, I forget what it's called, but his name's Tony K. He said he watched it 33 times or what already. That's too many times. Yeah, it's, it that's, might be too many times. That's way too many times. <laughs> that's from what I got from him is that I have to see it and I've been procrastinating because Hulu has a, like a good selection. People sleep on Hulu, I think. Yeah, I really have to see that film. And what's your favorite streaming service, Zach? I, I like oh, Hulu, so, um, but I mean, I think they all have their their they're all so good right now. It's like just they the are. libraries are insane. I don't want to say I don't want to pick one just because <laughs> I uh, I'm trying to sell to all of them right oh, now. Okay. I don't want to play favorites, but it's a uh, which one do you like the most for like new releases? Let's say that. I mean, Netflix is great because they'll drop things you're not expecting because they're not going off of IP. It's very a lot of originals for the most part. And then, but HBO Max, if you're like a big franchise person, is just ridiculous. Yeah. Like the, the fact that they're also doing all the theatrical releases on there uh, is amazing. So it's a, uh, it's some good. I mean, and also all the Hulu shows, there's not a ton. Same with Amazon. There's not a lot of them, but the ones that are there are just, oh, they're so good. Yeah, the quality and like you said, stuff like Nomad Land is now on Hulu. Yeah. With, yeah. So they have a bunch of quality small stuff and price points are different. They're, they're all pretty great. But we're going to kick it off today with Zach. You grew up in Seattle and there's not really too much of a film scene now in my mind. But was filmmaking on your radar as a possible career when you were in your like high school days? Sure. Um, I mean, I, when I was like a little, little kid, me and my brother would make like little handy cam videos. We had one of those cameras. I don't even know if, if you guys would remember them, but there you like, you put your hand into a little strap and you hold it like this that our dad had. And we just make dumb it's little like videos on the sidewalk. Um, yeah. And then, I, I was terrible at everything. I tried a bunch of different activities. I was awful at sports, awful at like art things. And then I, I, I got this, like, um, I did like this, like one week, like film, like camp at the, at the Y over the summer. And I, I made a short and I remember it was like the first time I was getting like positive approval from people. And I was like, I just really loved it too. Cause I, I just like very jankily edited it myself and and directed it and like just like 
just messing with camera angles. And I, I just remember loving it so much. And then throughout high school, I was making shorts. Um, and I didn't think it would be a career. I just thought it would be a fun thing to do. And I, I knew I enjoyed it. So I just did it as much as I could. Yeah. So your lemonade stand and your early filmmaking are the only things you got positive attention for? My lemonade stand? Yeah. Or was that just a short story that I read? What, where did, wait, what, what short story? You did incredible research. I feel like you know more you. Well, than you, I do. And w one of the first lines was that you were like a really great entrepreneur and you like sold for 75 cents. Wait, pounds. where did you find that? I don't think that's online. It definitely is, Zach. Or I broke into the Brown University database. If you want me to send me all of my, your. Words. I would love to see that. I did not know that was online. That's I will crazy. definitely send it. I, I did my research, Zach. Man, so. you should work for the CIA or something. That's crazy. I don't even think I have a copy of that. How did you? It's a good essay. When did you write that? In college? It, uh, I was going to turn that into a, a, a short, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm still, I'm still just baffled that you found that. I, I don't think there's too many Zach Warren scenes that went to Brown University, so I just assumed it was you. <laughs> yeah. Good on you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you had a great lemonade stand that was successful, and we <laughs> might possibly see into a short film someday. So my God. I'm up to that. I was just frantically trying to Google it and I could not find it. So whatever, whatever like FBI database you're in. I'll, I'll uh, cite my sources to you later, Zach. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you've been like an entrepreneur, a really creative person from what I heard from you through your writing. So was that kind of innovation and like trying new stuff? That's always been in you as a person, right? I think it was a, a mix of things. I think it's one, it's like fun to try new things. Two, I like... I didn't have a choice because I wasn't good at doing like the normal stuff. So I just had to do like the weird other, other version and would get positive feedback for that. But I think in this industry, you really have to be like, you're almost like you're a one person business. Cause you have to like really sell it and market yourself in a big way. And you have to have, you know, you have to be managing all these, you know, um, like all your projects and what stage is at and all the relationships and take it to different producers and all the, 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 the stuff of pitching and, and making stuff, especially on the, on with filmmaking. Like if you're a director, I feel like 10% of the job is the actual art of it. And 90% is just like emails and, and spreadsheets and planning. <laughs> and it's, it sounds like, you know, you know all about that. So it's just, um, I think having that kind of like very organized, entrepreneurial, loving, you know, Google spreadsheets type thing is, is a helpful skill. Yeah, Googling, doing your research. I'm used to that. I I always thought that was more of a producer role, but I you can't just sit back and let that fall to someone else sometimes. So I remember that was a thing from, I went to a talk with Darren Aronofsky and he said the oh, same wow. thing when he was making Mother. He said he spent, did like 5% of his job was filmmaking and 95% of his job was like just trying to coordinate other people. Wow. That's a crazy film too. I don't know much about the like pre-production or post, but you've seen it, right? Mm -hmm. It's great. People hate on it, but it's one of the films that I like best from him. So I can't wait to see what he does next. That was his last one. You know, his next one's with Brian Frazier, or Brendan Frazier. That that's yeah. a weird one. But anyway, what was your plan going to college or like past college? My bad, Zach, because like you can see it on from online, you went for neuroscience and like down the medical path. So what did you think you were going to get out of college? Was it more of like a adventurous thing, finding yourself like you did uh, eventually? But like going in did you think i am set to this path or is it i'm gonna find my way once i get there um 
I mean, it's kind of a mix of all of that. Cause I, I, I had no illusions that like filmmaking was a, a stable or viable career after college. I think I was, when I was in school, I got very involved in making shorts and in the comedy scene um, on campus and like sketch and stand up and, and like a onion type satirical newspaper. And I love doing comedy, but I uh, also knew, you know, I want to be able to have some sort of not backup plan because I really did love doing science, but just another path that felt a little bit more uh, stable um, and that my mom was proud of. And that um, the other reason I liked studying not, I think there was a lot of benefits to the kids who studied film and, and TV and comedy and writing in school just because they felt like they had a leg up immediately once they got out. But I liked studying something completely unrelated because college is like your last chance to like learn about something like, like, I don't want to say random, but like, when else in my life, in my life, am I going to spend four years learning about one organ in the body? So it was just like, yeah. I was just studying brains and it was very, it's just like fun diving into some random thing. And now I've got the next, I don't know, 60 years of my life or whatnot to, to get deeper into TV and film. Um, but I, I really, I, I didn't, I was on that uh, medical school path, but always was making shorts, doing comedy, doing live shows on the side. Um, so I never quite, I never, I never had any illusion about being a guaranteed thing, but I, I also was still trying and kind of doing this like scattershot approach. Yeah. Trying both ways. Cause you're fully into both and you're successful at both had a 4.0 <laughs> at neuroscience at brown and then you're with brown stand-up comics out of bounds the racist jug and the brown loser. <laughs> it was only so, racist in like the 1920s by the time i was there it was it was yeah, a you fine it. it was a fine uh publication <laughs> yeah <laughs> but in my mind like they're completely on different sides of the spectrum like memorization is a core aspect of a lot of medical fields at least in college in my mind and then like comedy and filmmaking that's a lot of just I'll, my stuff is like originality and trying to be new so it seems like it fed both of those uh, tastes and for you at least right yeah yeah for sure i mean i think it was i think it was helpful doing something else too so i had more like more information to draw upon. I had more like more details for types of jokes I could make or like just like another genre of thing that made me slightly unique compared uh, to some of the other folks. And I think it was also just like, a, a it helped me like work ethic wise of just like, I didn't mind being in the library studying till two in the morning, either setting up for a movie or, or studying for like a biochem exam. It was, um, uh, I, I just, I just got used to it. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't unpleasant either way. So you did film stuff while you were at Brown. I, in my mind, you were mostly just on the comedy side doing stand up and like writing for your like group and the newspaper, but you did film stuff there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would try to do like one, I would take four or five courses a semester and I try to do one that was either some like writing or filmmaking real like related so um in the filmmaking ones i would make shorts like very weird things also in the sketch group we would do video sketches and i would shoot and edit and light and sometimes be in them and just like kind of do the whole gamut of production so i got a little taste of everything and then um and then i did a uh i, I you were mentioning this in the it, when we were in the room but i did a, a semester abroad at a film school so i could just do one semester just kind of like fully diving into it which was nice too just to like just to like get neck deep in for for you know six months or whatever it was yeah so that's the film and tv school of the academy of performing arts in prague a bit of a mouthful but what did you learn there that you didn't and couldn't learn at at brown like what did hmm. what did they offer you yeah so that was a this really, is it's this yeah. place called famu is like the okay. is f-a-m-u is the the acronym for it and it was i think what was very helpful about it is 
the the like media program at Brown, at least while I was there, was very theoretical. It was very like film theory and Freudian analysis of films and things like that. That I, I just wanted to be like, where do I put a light? It's like really tell useful, me what yeah. lens to use. And what in doing just one semester of film school, I got all that kind of technical training. I I even learned all like the color grading and learned at what all the different all different kinds of lenses we shot on 16 millimeter and like just like we're you just had I just kind of got this crash course in like physical production that I couldn't get uh in the kind of like more theoretical classroom uh experience which I think they're both useful but I, I just wanted the hands-on element at some point, just so I, you know, knew knew what a, a kino light was and whatnot. Yeah. So all the hands-on stuff seems like it came on from, how do you say it, FOMU? Uh, FAMU. FAMU in Prague. How, how was that whole experience like? You, you said it, was it one semester or one year? It was just one semester. Oh, wow. we, it all built to doing like one 16 millimeter short and... Um, it was also nice just like really focusing on one short for an entire semester. It was very easy just because it was like the class, there wasn't a ton of homework and stuff. So it was also a fun experiment experience. You just get to dive into doing one thing. Yeah. So Dear Meets, that short film that you shot in the Czech Republic, how did you find those actors? And did they speak English? Like, was it hard mm -hmm. to find them? Yeah, so it was, it was all in Czech. So we had a translator translate the script and then to actually direct it, a lot of like, like, you know, hand gestures and kind of emoting. But then when we actually needed to give direction, we had a translator on set and our producer had introduced us to different actors and we had held auditions, which was always so weird because it's like, it's not in your language, which was interesting, but it's also like, I don't know if that's a good line read. It sounds good to me, but I don't know if they're saying the words weird or or, or in a specific intonation that's unusual. Um, yeah, so that was, I remember actually there was one other film that they, they showed it at the very end of the semester. And the only comment from all the like Czech professors, it was like, it was so interesting. You got actors with that dialect and they were like, wait, what did we do? And they'd gotten like actors. They just happened by accident to get all actors with very thick Slovakian accents. That is from like the South of, of, of uh, what, what it used to be one country, Czechoslovakia. Now it's Czech Republic of Slovakia, but they got all these people from this one region. It would be like, and it completely changed like the meaning of it. Cause it's like, imagine if you did a short and everyone had like a thick That's Southern true, accent. Yeah. It kind of changes the characters and what the, the movie's trying to say. So I guess we got lucky that just we met these actors and they were amazing. It was a real father son pair, which made it very easy to do. Um, and they were they were awesome. It just came for anything. Did the whole course kind of build up to creating that short? Yes and no. I mean, there were other like there was other like assignments and homework and smaller film projects and acting projects and editing projects, but it was it definitely had the structure of like, we're all building to this one final project. Cool. And you had like three directors on that. So was it just people that you met during the program or were they from Brown too? No, it was um, these two guys from Bowdoin um, and they're Eric and David and they're brilliant guys. And, and it was just that the way the program worked is that you were in teams of three or four and, um, we all did a, a, you know, we all we all did a, a lot. You know, one of some one of us concentrated more on editing. I one of us concentrated more on shooting, and one of us concentrated more on on directing. And we all, um, but we all were were dabbling in, in everything, which is just kind of the nature of film school is that you try to do everything. And you all wrote the script, or who's was it? Your brainchild. It came from an idea I had, but then we all kind of fleshed it out together. Okay. It, it From seeing some of your other stuff, it kind of seems like your style, so I just assumed. Thank you? <laughs> yeah. Maybe? <laughs> kind of dark, humorous in a way twist, so that uh, kind of seems like you. But after you finished your uh, semester abroad, you came back to Brown, and when did you finally like take the 
passion of filmmaking and when did it like mean more than your medical field passion? Like when did that take priority? Uh, I don't know if it ever has. Like still Never to this day, been. I'm like, oh, did I make the wrong decision? Should I go back? I think it was, it was truly just, um, I took a year off after college to, I, I got a job as a page at Letterman and I was also doing like shooting and editing these like industrial videos for a textbook just to pay rent. And I was living in uh, New York at the time in this two bedroom and we had three guys living in there. We built like this extra room into the living room with Ikea uh, bookcases and a wardrobe that we punched the back out of us and had like used that like a sliding door, like line and witch in the wardrobe style. And just in that first year, I was applying for neuroscience scholarships and, and uh, medical school stuff. And then also in that year, I was like, I'm just going to do as much comedy as I can and see if I can get any traction. Sorry, there's a dog outside if you can hear a lot of barking right now. But um, I, I got lucky and then I just uh, I started this live show and we got some attention. Um, uh, the first few shows went very well and we got this like little New York Times blurb and then we started um, making videos and some of them we just w were doing well online. And then uh, Jimmy Kimmel reached out to me. He just slid into my DMs one day. Uh, I didn't know anyone on the show, had no industry connections. Um, he just had seen some of v these videos going viral and then just looked up who made them. And uh, and it was really just that because I was... I was out of money and would and was ready to, to go back to, to school. And then I got a job. So I was like, oh, I'll see where this goes. And then I've been stuck in it since. So you kind of had a dead end and then you made Garlic Jackson. Is that what it's called? Yeah. And then with all these different people, you're making these shorts. And then just out of the blue, Jimmy Kimmel slid in. And that's where you are now. So. Yeah, I worked there for three years and was very grateful he took a chance on me it was a very stressful time at first because i was on a week by week trial period where every friday i would find out if i was coming back the following monday so i never really i never felt like even once i was there like i had you know that kind of like uh feeling of of security and stableness i don't know if that ever exists in this industry at all um but so i was always kind of like well, maybe I should start getting my applications ready again or like you didn't know, but then it, I just kept getting renewed and was doing a, a good enough job, I guess, that, that they didn't lose me. That reminds me of like, we had a guest that was uh, someone on SNL. He was a cast member on SNL. And he said like, he didn't think he was coming back the next season. So he was really stressed out, but when he knew he wasn't coming back, he just had fun with it. So <laughs> That just seems like the kind of the mindset. How did you figure out every week? When did they just say you're good for next week? Are you available? Or did they give you pretty much? Or... Yeah, it was. Um, I think I would just get an email like "We'll see you Monday" or something like that. I forget what it was. <laughs> it was when did that stop after? Like four months or... or so of like wow. trial period, and then I was still scared that they. It, the way director contracts work on, on shows like that is you, your contract only lasts a week. So you're literally being renewed constantly. And so you, you, they can also lose you constantly or you can find other work, but it's, it, there's very few, like, I guess you call them like nine to fives in this industry. And that's as close to one as you can get in directing is, is late night. Um, yes. Just as you know, no, normally if you're directing episodes, like let's say a sitcom, you're doing like two weeks of very intensive work uh, and then not working for a while until you get the next episode. Or if you're doing a movie, you might be in pre-production for three months, but not actually um, on set. Or like if you're in development, you might be spending years writing and, and pitching and things like that without being on set. And the, the hours are all wonky. So late night was a nice, like um, kind of like first foray into it. That gave me a little stability and a little confidence. Um, and then it was also nice just that working for a late night show, we did so many parodies of all different kinds of genres. So I did like a, a, a Western and like um, a 1940s, like silent movie style and a, and a zombie movie. And just when you, in comedy, so much of what you do is parodies. 
Uh, so it was like almost like this crash course and all these different styles, which end up being very helpful down the line for, for directing other types of, of work. I want to go back to Garlic Jackson for a second, because how did that kind of come up to you? It was it just an avenue to kind of express your comedic side after you left Brown and how did you yeah. find these people? Were they from Brown? No, only two of them. So, um, uh, so in, in college, I had, was part of this sketch group you mentioned called Out of Bounds. And I did a, every semester we did a two hour and a half long shows. And I just loved it. It was just like my favorite thing. You would write and direct and act and all your own stuff, do all this, um, all, all these sketches. And, and the crowds were very uh, accepting and warm. And I just loved it so much. And then when I got out of school, I was like, I want to recreate that. I want that feeling. And there were different, um, I don't know what you call them, but like different um, comedy communities. There was like okay. UCP and The Pit and Magnet. And in LA, you had Groundlings and, and IO and things like that. But uh, I tried to do UCB and they were very, um, you could, if you like did well, you could, you had to take all these classes or you had to submit a half hour script that you like just wrote, but couldn't be in or direct. But there was this other theater called The Pit, um, which uh, you could just like apply for. And I got an hour long slot and I was like, OK, great. Now I need to put together a group. So there were um, two of the members I'd worked with in college. So we we wrote this first hour together and then brought in um, one of the other Letterman pages who I thought was so funny. This guy named Will Temper and then a, a guy that. Um, named Sam Clemmer, who who's also uh, hilarious. That that one of the other members brought in, and then um, and these uh, these other three members came in as well. So by the time we did our first show, we had eight people, um, and then we were like, and then the pit asked us. They're like, okay, great, that went well. You sold it out. Do you want to do another show next month? And we we're like, great. Look, now I guess we're a group of group of eight or or nine, I guess by the end. And you just recorded those shows. And Do we just record them? Yeah, you just recorded them and put them online, right? Uh, not a, we didn't put a lot of the live stuff okay. online. Live comedy doesn't like really work very well on like online. It's like kind of like shot from like this high angle. It's a live stage. Like the suspension of disbelief doesn't quite work. The laughter drowns out some of the lines. I think uh, the things that did well online were like things that we shot. Well, more Before short okay. more like you know the snl like digital short type things where it's specifically made for video okay and that's what uh the kim the kimmel saw the yeah that's what he okay. saw. cool i think but, i mean he never told me that, well, exactly what exactly. he saw but he he had reached out saying i saw your videos so i just assume that's what he saw so cool, yeah, you use your resources, the minimal resources that you had, the people that you knew, where you were. And at that time, like after Brown, you moved to LA, I'm assuming? Oh, I, this was all in New York. In, all in New York, okay. So I, I mean, a lot of people say like, where, where do you move after school? And um, I would say it's if you wanna be in the industry, I guess this is pre-pandemic, everything's different now, but it used to be if you wanna be in comedy, you have to go to LA, New York, or Chicago. And people say, which one do I go to? Is it this, is it this, is it this? It's like, go to whichever one your friends are in. Because that, like, go to where your community is. Because for example, for me in New York, we, we had no money. All these things were $0 budgets, but you would be like, oh, I have a friend who has a DSLR and I have another friend who has a boom mic and another friend who has a light. And you can kind of just like, based on your friendships and community, kind of piece together, um, these like these shoots and make them look halfway decent. But if you're by yourself, it's very kind of hard to find that community out for, uh, 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 at the beginning. So I think just like having, trying to, to build a community, it almost doesn't matter what city you're in. You could be in Atlanta, you could be in Toronto, you could be, you could be in, in Cleveland, it, it, it could be anywhere. Yeah, because you could be anywhere because you put your stuff online and it gets seen by pretty cool people and that's how you got your start so yeah now especially when live comedy doesn't matter quite as much as it did just because of the pandemic and all and that you know things can blow up pretty easily there wasn't as much like vi virality but i mean there was viral sketches but today it's just such a bigger thing of like things are going viral on twitter every day it was not that i'm like a thousand years old but when i was first coming up 
the way things would go viral is they would have to get written about in like BuzzFeed or Gawker and they would embed the video and then you get X number of views just from people clicking through the articles and stuff like that. Yeah, that's that, 10 years ago, but so much has changed since then. It's crazy. It's a daily, every day that like resets and it's a whole new like stream of content. Then it's yeah. like around a lot longer. So not even 10 years. I was like, eight years ago eight years. Yeah. yeah yeah so it's it's the whole the whole landscape is very different now one last question till we jump fully into your kimmel section of your life what was after you moved on from brown was any easy conversation with your parents <laughs> to decide to you you touched upon it a little bit with your mother but yeah you wanted to kind of put the medical path on hold and try to give a few years into this filmmaking path. How was that conversation with your parents? Um, I think it was, it was a because I think they knew, because I'd been doing comedy and film for so long and like doing like bits and pieces that it really wasn't until Kimmel that it was like, okay, this is like a full-time thing really. Cause I always still had one foot in both worlds and they were very supportive. They're very nice. They, they, you know, I think if you're a parent, you go, you know, is the, what's the stability in this? Is Are they going to give up everything and then work for six months and then never work again? So I think they were nervous and uh, things like that. But I, you know, they're also, they're very supportive. But, you know, you, even when I got hired for SNL as a writer, I told my, I told my mom, I was like, mom, I got my dream job as a writer for SNL. And she goes, oh, that's wonderful. I heard Mount Sinai Medical School likes admitting writers. I was like, oh, so it was like, even then it wasn't like, you know, but, but they're very supportive. And I think it's, I've, you know, worked for, for consistently for long enough that they, they don't bring it up as much, but it's, it's still, you know, it's never a safe career. It will, even at this stage where things are, you know, things are moving a little bit more it's it's still very a scary it's not like you go and get a law degree and then you'll work for the rest of your life it's it's a it's a very scary career to be to be in yeah you gotta keep proving yourself constantly because the consciousness refreshes very often so you have to keep doing stuff often and you touched upon it too like your kind of dream job was to be a writer on snl but you were a segment director on Kimmel. So did you like kind of write the skits or like the segments on Kimmel and how did that uh, translate to getting a job on SNL? Uh, the, the, the way I got the job on SNL is I submitted a packet because by the time I was on Kimmel, I had an, uh, an agent and he would submit what, what they're called packets. That's how you get jobs on late night shows is um, where you essentially write a, a partial episode. So SNL, their packet is five sketches of di these different types that they ask for. The the Daily Show derivative shows are all like you write like a segment of the show with all these like clips and, and news articles and stuff like that. So, um, so they kind of had nothing to do with each other. I just submitted a packet to SNL and they liked it. I had no connections there or anything. I didn't come in recommended. They just, I got lucky that they liked my writing. Um, and then it was... I, I, even while I was at Kimmel, I was still writing a lot. Like I was on a UCB house team as a writer and I was, um, you know, ri still writing videos for Garlic Jackson and still, you know, submitting stuff to like the New Yorker and McSweeney's. And so I was always kind of trying to do both. And even to this day, I still, I still do both directing and writing. Great. <laughs> that's, I never knew about that process of the packet. So that's awesome to hear about. And it, like you said, there's not much of a connection there with Kimmel and SNL, two different networks. I mean, it didn't, it didn't hurt to have yeah. it like on my resume, but it didn't, it wasn't like the reason it wasn't like a natural path. It was yeah. just, it just kind of was ha happenstance. Yeah. It, it didn't seem like you had any shortcut other than you had experience and you write a lot from those different websites and all your different work. Like you said, as a segment director on SNL, the shooting schedule in my mind would be crazy just because five shows a week usually. Uh, so how was that kind of like, did you, like you said on like sitcoms, they try to shoot five, sh 
five shows in like three days maybe was that how it was did you try to shoot all of your segments in a very like tight period of like two days for the week um it was week? usually um it was kind of all over the map so with late night shows especially like the daily ones like kimmel or, or colbert or things like that the sketches are usually there are times where they're written in the morning you're doing pre-pro during early early morning and or late morning and then by afternoon you're shooting and it's airing that night and it's just oh, like wow. this insane scramble that that you would usually have like a few days of prep and then a few days of editing. So it was still very fast um, at Kimmel. At SNL, we write it Tuesday, Wednesday, and then uh, pre-pro Thursday, Friday, shoot it Friday, edit s Friday night into Saturday right up until the show. So it's it's a very fast turnaround. And, and sitcoms aren't sitcoms are actually much slower usually unless it's a multi-cam. So single cam shows, you know, like uh, The Office or Brooklyn Nine-Nine, those that are not in front of an audience that are on, on location or on, you know, closed sets, those ones take longer. It's usually a few weeks per episode or you're back shooting uh, like two at the same time. But um, for multicams, like you're talking about that are like shot in front of an audience, those they'll sometimes shoot the whole thing on a Friday. Yeah. So it seems like you shot a lot in a short period and, but how is the writing process like with the writers on Jimmy Come Alive? Did you work closely with them or was it kind of segmented? They sent you the scripts that they wrote. How was that like? Um, I mean, you work super close with them, but that it was, I was a, like I was hired as a director and uh, what these, these shows are, are all union based and the unions kind of each have their own slice of the pie. So writers are the only ones who are allowed to like physically put words on a page. So I would be, you know, writing with them or throwing out lines on set, but they're the ones actually writing. And I'm the only one who talks to the actors. And you like, if you want to just move a, 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 like a cup one inch to the left, you have to ask a prop person. And like, so things they do, people do have their slices of the pie, but you're all collaborating um, very tightly. And it kind of just depends on the, the strictness of the set. Yeah, coming from a non-union based world so far, that it seems like a huge change in my mind. And for you too, like how segmented it was and you don't you have to have permission and do a lot of stuff. So Yeah, I mean when I was shooting my own sketches and shorts and stuff, it was like I literally do everything. I would be carrying in my own lights, setting up the grip, setting up the lights, putting on, you know, the all the flags and, and setting up the camera, doing the cards, doing the DIT media dumps, doing all the costuming and, and with the bringing, showing up with a duffel full of props and then going from all of that to, I, I'm just allowed to show up and talk to the actors and talk to the different departments. It's a very different, um, it took a little getting used to. Was that more stressful or less stressful for you since you kind of control it, but I don't know. That could be freeing or kind of imprisoning in a way. It was, it was both. I mean, it was times where I was like, I just want to turn that three degrees to the left and I couldn't. And it was like too it was not worth calling someone because they're in the bathroom to like come and turn that three degrees. And it's just like, all right, fine. It's good enough. Uh, but then it's also like, okay, I don't have to worry about, you know, the people who work there are so brilliant. Like they're just like, you could say like I, in the morning, this sketch has a, a 20 foot tall sculpture of David Hasselhoff. And then by two, and they're like, okay. And then by 2 PM, they built it. Like, they're just like these like genius craftspeople who are able to do so much, build sets, make props, do wardrobe, do hair, do all these different things. So being able to kind of like take, you know, go like this, okay, you guys do your magic. You guys are all better at your job than I will ever be. So it's that, that, that part is very freeing of just trusting, trusting others, but coming from a world where you do everything yourself, it was hard at first to, to trust others. Cause you just want to be like, I, I know it all. I, I'm used yeah. to touching the keys. I'm used to doing it all. Yeah. If that would ever happen to me, I, I'm, if there would be a big transition and a big wave wake up call, but uh, also the amount of improv on during the segments, like you said, I don't think you would have to talk to the writers about that with the actors, just improving and like kind of riffing on whatever they wrote. Uh, was there a lot of that during the segments? Oh yeah. I mean, 
that I would always try to build that into the schedules with the producers of like, just give me a few minutes at the end of each shot to, you know, riff with them. That's, that's a, like so much of Judd Apatow's movies are just him coming up with stuff on set. And that's like where you get this, that stuff that feels just like so fresh and, and unwritten, which is kind of what you're going for. So I would, it's, it's tougher when you're going really fast. You know, I only have 90 minutes to shoot this three pages or whatever, or, or less. And, time than that or or if it's things that are super elaborate like i have this shot on a crane and as this thing fire comes up and then you know you've got a car skidding and those are the times it's very hard to improvise just because it's so meticulous um but when you have just you know some nice wide some nice mediums and a few actors saying dialogue it's it's i i think that you get a lot out of um be, being loose and i think not being precious about what was on the page is, is very important definitely and during some like the mid part of your time at Kimmel, you like, were like a co-director with Jonathan Kimmel. So did that kind of divide the responsibility with you? Oh, uh, no, we, we no? weren't. I mean, there were there were four directors, four oh, okay. segment directors, and we, we were all just um, doing different segments. Right? Yeah, we'd all just get assigned different, okay, different, cool. uh, different sketches. So how was that designed? They just threw it in your mailbox whatever sketch you're doing i mean there, there there's a, a lot of emails and okay i mean we're you're all in an office together so it's there's a lot of producers and, and, things, and coordinators and things like that cool so yeah so kimmel seems like a really i don't know if it wasn't for kimmel did you think you would probably still be down that medical path right now it's very i mean it's Pretty likely. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I was running out of money when I got that job and I, I was running out of time before having to make decisions and, um, you know, getting pressure. So it was, it was, I mean, it definitely helped a lot. I mean, it, it wasn't the only path in, but it definitely ended up being my path in. Um, but at the same time, I was also trying to do other things like trying to uh, I was submitting for like The Onion and these shorts for MTV and um, like the doing random jobs for College Humor. And I was just kind of doing anything I could do to to like expand my network or get, get a get a job here or there. Or I was even doing random stuff like I would shoot corporate videos and and just like be the cameraman in the back of a Marriott shooting some random like insurance salesman conference or like, you know, just like anything to, to, to make some money or, or be, you know, get more experience and, and hands on uh, with the cameras and, and everything. For all the college students out there, you touched upon it, but do you recommend moving to moving anywhere or like just going where your friends are like you said uh, yeah i would just go where your friends are if your friends are staying in town and you want to make stuff with them stay with them like i i think your friends will end up mattering a lot more your community let's call it community not just friends because you, you'll build your community like the people i worked with right out of school weren't all people i knew from school it was a lot of people it was a few people from school but then also people you meet and have similar vibes and you know you just get along but I think go where your community is because your community is going to elevate you a lot more than any city would. Awesome. Cause we've had a lot of guests on here. That's the first time I've heard that. And that's, that's something I'll take with me. So I appreciate you saying that. I hope. Well, just like anytime friends. someone's like, you got to move to New York. It's like, well, why, why? Like <laughs> it's hard to get a job in New York and LA or you got to move to LA. It's just cause they did that first. And maybe there's like certain opportunities, you know, LA has more shooting. So if you want to be a PA, maybe there's, or, or you want to work as a, uh, in the mailroom at an agency or something, there's more jobs there, but there's also jobs like that in New York. And maybe that's not your path in. I just think if you really want to make your own stuff and be, a writer, director, creative, and try to break in that way, I would just, it doesn't matter where you are as much as where your community is. Thank you. And one of the things since Kemmel that you've done is worked and created stuff for Quibi. Mm -hmm. So, and some, some of the stuff is in the more compass, which stars from what I know, Bill Burr mm -hmm. and toothpicks. I'm not too sure who's in that, but you've had your hand in these two projects from Quibi. So what was your experience working with the people of Quibi? Um, Quibi, I mean, it was a sh very short lived, poorly advertised network that it's a shame that it, 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 it didn't survive because 
you know, people laugh about it, but they were, they were giving money to comedians you like to do interesting, weird projects. Like it, it wasn't like they were, they, they were, they were trying experimental stuff. They were doing cool things. The fact that the pandemic hit right as they were launching and the fact that they had some marketing trip ups, um, obviously it didn't work out, but it was nice to have another network to sell to. It was nice to have another place, more options for comedy. And I think the executives and the people who worked there were awesome. It just, you know, if it, it just, you know, the people didn't want it. Um, but now a lot of those shows got sold to Roku. So Roku, they're going to become Roku originals. So if you have the, that stick in the back of your TV, and they might start making, you know, you have these places that pop up all the time that try to do this. Like IMDb TV is trying to do that right now. And, and Roku is going to do that. There was survey monkey that like, or man, or what is it? MailChimp. Mail is, is survey monkey one? Yeah. I, that's familiar. I think it's MailChimp actually. Yeah. Not, not, sur- but MailChimp makes their funds, their own originals. So these places just like come up with, you know, there was, there's been all sorts of them like milk and go 90 and, and full screen and all these things, but people make fun of them because they failed, but you know, they were still trying to make good content and, and it's just more opportunities for filmmakers. Is it different making stuff for Quibi? Cause just cause how it was formatted was just very quick bite stuff under 10 minutes. Is that the, how you wrote the stuff under 10 minutes? Yeah. I mean, that was the, like, if it's a narrative sh- thing, instead of having, like you kind of write it as a, a narrative shows as like a movie in 10 parts with an, with a, a cliffhanger every 10 minutes. Or if it's a sketch show, it's just like three sketches. Or if it's, you know, the, uh, you know, however it is, um, it's just you do it in 10 minute chunks. The only difference is there was, you also shoot it, um, you shoot things horizontally, but also vertically. Um, so you're, you're shooting for extra jokes in mind of how it could oh. be vertical at the same time. Okay. That's cool. I, I know ne- I would never was a patron of Quibi. Uh, I apologize to, it's not Simon Kittenberg. I forget Jeffrey Katzenberg. That's the guy. I apologize, Jeffrey, for not attributing to the success of your service, but best of luck in the future. And <laughs> I look forward to see them more compass. I like to play on words. And toothpicks, can you give a hint of what that is? Because I have no idea. What toothpicks that was um, kind of the brainchild of um, these two friends uh, the, from this director, Dave Green, who uh, just is brilliant, very lovely human. Um, and it was, it's like a narrative sketch show. So it was like sketches, but it all weaves together, kind of like Mr. Show. But, but um, uh, imagine that shot like a very cinematic beautiful movie and much faster paced and anthology sketch show very cool i I'd, I'd be up for trying that out uh like, they have an instagram where that where it came from that was um there are like 30 second mini episodes it's all like it's all comedy around food culture okay I, so if you go to can, toothpicks uh toothpicks, instagram okay. they have some really awesome stuff and, and dave comes he's directed you know major huge motion pictures with like michael bay he did like one of the teenage mutant ninja turtle movies he did earth to echo like he's done huge stuff and he also has an incredible grasp of um special effects so they really really look cool and he also he's just a brilliant guy so i have to check that out now because come from you in my mind that means a lot so ah, ah come on uh and one of your projects that i'm looking forward to is floss and I was wondering, did you shoot that during COVID? Oh, God, no. No, I'm oh, very God. COVID safe. I haven't okay. been inside another building in like four months. Um, Congrats. I mean, it's nothing to congratulate about. It's all terrifying. And I'm just very lucky I can I can stay inside for the most part. But it's um, uh, uh, it was shot w- way before, maybe okay. a year before. But we, there, we did pickups later, and then we're cutting it. And... Um, I'm going to recut it once COVID ends. So it's just, it's, it's still in progress, but it's a short I'm very excited about with, um, some really awesome actors, uh, Kate McCucci and Peter McNichol, Avery Monson, Guy Branham. Uh, so some really cool folks that, that I've looked up to for a while. Just, you know, I'm very lucky they agreed to be in it. Um, and I think it looks cool. I mean, we'll, we'll hopefully people I, like I really it. I like the poster. So oh, thank you. <laughs> to me, posters 
like are really un underlooked part of filmmaking nowadays. So I'll tell you, it is it, in the, from on the from the film and TV side, it is not overlooked. It's like the number one thing. I mean, I can tell you're a poster guy with everything in your room right there, but it's it's there's almost as much thought put into billboards from like the marketing team as there is into the actual product. The amount of just face posters I see, though, like with like face I like posters? the art. Yeah, like. I don't know, like kind of like the Tarantino one. You just have I have one of life. Uh it's with Jake Jolen Hall. It's like it's it's like a space film, but they just have like three it looks like Mount Rushmore. You just have three faces. It could be to any film. Like it has nothing to do with the theme of the film. And just the creativity, the originality, the art of it, not just a photograph of a face. And that's why I, I kind of like flaws this poster, because I've never seen anything like a tooth with like floss wrapped around it. Like I, I never saw anything like that. So there's something new there. Thank you. Wow. I, I love posters and, and just even for dear me, the, your poster for that was pretty cool and artistic. And thank I you. Yeah. We had an awesome uh, artist do that. Uh, it's a great part. And what's the time length of floss? If you like on the cut that you have. I think the current one's 13 minutes. Cool. Okay. Which I think if you're, is not, kind of an awkward length. I think if you're trying to do the festival circuit, you want to go under 10 or like 20 or a feature. So it's kind of an awkward length, which is another one of the reasons I want to recut it. Okay, cool. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, make sure to, I'm, I doubt that you won't, but, or I doubt that you won't forget to advertise that on your social media because that's one thing that you're really known for. And do you think that Twitter and like really publicizing yourself and having your voice heard on Twitter has any way advanced your career that from what you can tell? Um, I think so. I mean, I, what's, yeah, I mean, it definitely has just cause it's like it, it's like a portfolio that everyone can see. So if, like it's a portfolio of jokes. So people can get a sense of my, my voice and my writing just from that. And, and some of them have done, done well and been shared a lot. So, you know, people have, you know, it, it comes up in meetings of like, you're meeting someone, they're like, Oh, I've, I've seen your name around. So it kind of helps of like break the ice. Um, I don't know if I've ever gotten something like directly because of Twitter. I pro probably certain things have come from that, but they didn't, you know, they didn't want to fess up to that. But I, I, I definitely think it's helped a lot and just kind of added some, it's hard to get your name out there, especially with like, you know, it, it's just good. You try, should try to do anything. And, and uh, unfortunately I, I am addicted to it and enjoy it in certain, you know, I hate it, but I love it. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I don't know. I, it's also just good practice too. Do you have a philosophy behind how you do it? Because behind tweets, yeah, behind your tweets and like how you, is it just whenever it comes to mind, you just let it flow, or that's it? Yeah. Cool. Because I I I've taken some uh, LinkedIn learning classes that say like that, that are very like superficial, and they say like make a whole day where you like create all of your posts for the whole month and like release them daily so you don't really have to think about it and you just have all your stuff but i mean i think a, a, a lot of what i i mean that might work for some people but for me a lot of what i do is is topical it's responding to the news or responding yeah. to things that are currently happening so even if i'm making a joke about something that was two days ago it feels old or even a week ago, it feels ancient. So doing a month ahead of time, it, it's, you know, there, it's like some, there are some evergreen jokes as that's like the term for it. It, it's not, to, it's not topical. Um, so, uh, so I have some of those, but, but I think Twitter is very much a platform of the moment. So it's hard to do that successfully as well. Some people do it brilliantly. Um, do you recommend for like people in the film industry to like have a presence on Twitter? I mean, if you enjoy it and are willing to do it and to willing to go years with no likes, I mean, I, I think I got on in like 2011 or something. I feel like my first two years or, or so I was doing jokes every 
day or every few days. And if I got one like, I would be happy. Um, so it's, it definitely took a lot, a lot, a lot of effort to build and just jokes, multiple jokes every single day, every single day, over and over and over again, and interacting and just being part of the community, part of the platform. And it took a while to get there. So if you're willing to put in the investment, I think it can be very, very worthwhile, but it, it, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. Awesome. And what are you working on next, Zach? Where, and what can we see you? And like, where you, what can we see your work? And yeah, what um, are you gonna do next? We're excited to see Right you. now I'm doing a lot of development, which is pretty much like pitching mo movies and shows. So I'm, I'm very excited about, I, I, I'm pretty far down the line with a few of them that uh, I will, you know, will, will, you know, be announcing, you know, as, as they come to, come to life. But um, I'm really enjoying that like world building type element, um, which is, is just like very fun figuring out characters, figuring out worlds, figuring out dynamics and kind of building from scratch is kind of my current um, challenge that I'm really loving. Would you be up for directing the scripts that it sounds like you're working on? Oh, hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's just, it's, cool. it's, it's, uh, I mean, there are projects that I, I would write and direct. There are projects I just write, some I just direct. It's, it's tough because if it's a, if it's, if it's a huge, if it's a series you're selling to Netflix, the pilot, they're going to want to get a big director. You know, they're, 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 I haven't done as much, um, episodic work. So they want to, uh, as a director. So they would usually want to get like someone who's done uh, tons of those before. So until you have some sort of, you know, film festival indie darling that you directed, it's, e it's actually sometimes easier to break in as, um, in the film world and then go to TV, but it's all kind of content at this point. So it's all like, just do whatever you can do to direct and write anything. And it doesn't matter what length it is. Yeah. I'm excited to see how you further transform your career because you've been kind of everywhere and to see you do a feature, direct a feature, write a feature, or like you said, maybe episodic. I'm very excited to see what you do next. Just yeah, it's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, just to see how it transforms. And that gives me kind of a bit of hope to see that once you do something, you're not really pigeonholed and like like in down a narrow path. Because you've done a lot of very diverse stuff in your young career so far. Yeah, I mean, I think that's been somewhat by design and, and somewhat by fear is that some people are like, I am a, I write, low budget horror movies and that's all i do or like i'm i do you know i only do coming of age uh half hour shows about uh young women in the south or like whatever it is some people have their niche and they're amazing at it and they always get work in that niche i never had that niche i never had like i'm this kind of guy it was partly because i love doing all sorts of things it's partly out of fear that I wouldn't get enough work doing just one thing. So I tried to do everything. So I'm like, oh, maybe I can work here and work here or work here. Uh, and it's also just to keep it fresh. So I, I just, I enjoy doing different things because the challenges are always new. Awesome, yeah. I'm, it's awesome that you said that. Thank you for coming. And one last question is, what advice would you have to someone who's currently in college and whose goal is it to direct live television like segments like you did any words of wisdom that you wish you had before you did it i would say just make stuff constantly just like be constantly writing constantly directing a lot of people are like i can't make anything unless i know it's going to be perfect like just like there's very little cost to failing it may be monetary there is if you're sinking a lot of money into it but if something's bad the way the internet works is that you usually don't see it so it's not like you're going to be embarrassed. It's like, you're just going to keep making, like the more you make, the more you can fail safely is good because you, you, you'll you never know for sure if something's going to be good or not. So you just want to practice as much as you can and find a community where you can fail safely is very important. Thank you, Zach Bornstein. <laughs> I've learned a lot. The people that are listening and that will listen soon in the future, We'll learn a lot too. We appreciate you, you coming to KCYF's uh, Kent State series. We appreciate you. And 
thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a good luck. That's uh, I I hope I I'm I'm I thank you for for inviting me. I hope I hope it's helpful and and stay in touch. Yeah, uh, that's it, everyone.